On this episode of Urban U, over 130 nationalities are represented here at CUNY. We highlight the enrollment process for foreign students and domestic students who may be undocumented. We hear from two Hunter College grads who share the beauty of Ukraine's traditional music, a teacher who manipulates code to create music, and in the spirit of the holidays, a visit to the thriving Harlem African market through the lens of one of our CCNY student journalists. That and more, welcome to Urban U. Approximately one in every three CUNY undergrads are born outside the mainland United States, making them one of the most diverse collegiate communities in the country. And with that comes a variety of different enrollment resources that are accessible to both international and undocumented students. For Baruch, um, since I was in a community college already, I was already immersed into like the process of getting my visa, my I-9, um, and all of that paperwork, my F2 visa. But I reached out to the ISSC office here once I got accepted to Baruch, and I was like, hi guys, um, I'm gonna need a new I-9 um, document. Um, do you mind helping me with this? I was actually connected with my go-to advisor that I would speak to, like, you know, I'll go to the office house that they will have. The ISSC does a great job of, you know, making sure each semester they send emails about resources, or um, some of the advisors would check in, just like, hey, how's the semester going? Hope you're settling in well. If you have any questions, just remember that we have sessions that happens every week. From speaking with international students such as Pascalin, it's easy to see that they receive a lot of guidance throughout the enrollment process at CUNY. And it's been the culture, even when I was a student here, and I've tried to preserve that as the director, we do our best to advocate for our students. So during orientation, you know, I usually do a, a whole speech about, you know, looking at our office and the international student advisors like your adoptive parents, right? We take more of a community approach, looking at all factors that could create an obstacle in that student's academic career and trying to, you know, mitigate that. In addition to that, one of the things that we do is we try to host monthly workshops with our international students where they come in and it could be something simple as coffee hour, where we're picking their brains. Another important student body at CUNY are undocumented students who move to the U.S. at an early age but don't have citizenship status. And CUNY is trying to address their needs by dedicating resources to help undocumented students navigate college enrollment and degrees. John Jay's Immigrant Student Success Center has a peer fellowship program in which students go to high schools to uh, help undocumented students in that high school, immigrant students in that high school, apply for college and go to CUNY. Brooklyn College is starting a similar program this year. It's their first year doing it, so it's very exciting. And so these are two efforts within CUNY of folks uh, wanting to support explicitly this population in enrolling at, at our CUNY campuses. But the rest of the campuses don't necessarily have and that's because they don't have immigrant student success centers or full-time people that can help undocumented students navigate these processes or create a program related to this. There are campus liaisons, so the chancellor asked the campus presidents to identify at least two individuals who could be at our campuses. They attend trainings with me once a month, receive this kind of information, but because this isn't their full-time role, they aren't necessarily able to create these kind of peer mentorship programs that John Jay and Brooklyn College have created. We've been carefully watching those schools and, and seeing if there's any way that we could somehow replicate that same process here. But while that's ongoing, we do have support services here. And with that in mind, Cynthia has some advice for immigrant students looking to enroll at CUNY. I always encourage students to first uh, go to cuny.edu slash immigrant, and that's where we have the liaisons listed, the centers, the initiatives, efforts that are happening across the campuses. Checking out that page first to identify who's the right person to reach out to. If no one responds, to please reach out to my office, and then someone from our office will definitely respond. For Urban U, I'm Hannah Kavanaugh.
Thousands of years ago, poetry bound the earliest humans together in spoken form. Even in today's digital world, poetry has a purpose. That's according to one of CUNY's own, a poet who's being recognized with an honor many poets dream of. After leaving Roxruha, after crossing Mexico with a coyote. Rhythm and sound are gateways to meaning for poet and distinguished professor Kamiko Han. After reaching at midnight that barren New Mexico border, a man and his daughter looked to Antelope Wells for asylum and were arrested. When I was a little girl, uh, my mother would read stories to me and I loved the sound of the words after forms read in Spanish to the Mayan speaking father, after a cookie but no water, after the wait for the lone bus, I was enamored by the power of words and the playfulness of words. After boarding, after the little girl's temperature spiked, she suffered two heart attacks, vomited, and stopped breathing. Art should be a given in one's life. I think the point of life is stimulation. And uh, after food and shelter, I think human stimulation is oftentimes art. As one of four new chancellors elected to the Academy of American Poets this year, Kamiko Han will be an ambassador for poets and their art. She's published 10 collections of her own poems, earned fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts, and for 29 years has taught at Queens College, currently teaching creative writing and literary translation in the MFA program. As a former board member of the Poetry Society of America, the ones responsible for putting poetry in New York subway cars, she wants to use her new position with the Academy to bring more poetry into people's frenetic lives. There is self-awareness involved uh, and self, well, let's say self-connection and connecting the self to the outer world as well. The one she reads here from her collection, Foreign Bodies, offers that connection. She wrote it after reading a news article. The coroner examined the failed liver and swollen brain. Then Jacqueline's chest and head were stitched up and she returned to Guatemala in a short white coffin to her mother, grandparents, and dozens of women preparing tamales and beans to feed the grieving. Writing for people who have otherwise been marginalized is really a political act and giving my students an opportunity to express themselves is, for me, is a political act as well. Han also studies and teaches Zuihitsu, a form of writing from 10th century Japan, when Han says a golden age of literature flourished thanks to women. Neither poem nor poetic essay, and meaning running brush, the Zuihitsu is characterized by a lack of structure found in Western poems. Han published her own book of Zuihitsu, The Narrow Road to the Interior. When I was a young woman and just really starting out, there weren't a lot of published Asian American writers. Uh, there weren't a lot of Asian American teachers, for that matter. Being an Asian American poet and teacher has meant that I'm also a model, I'm a mentor, and for students who are not Asian American, I'm someone who is different as part of their diverse, increasingly diverse community. And that's really, really important to me. I'm Vivian Lee for Urban U. Still up on Urban U? More CUNY stories, including our student work series with a report on the thriving Harlem African market. But first, in honor of Remembrance Day, a look at the World War I chapter in CUNY history to learn how City College and Hunter College mobilized for the Great War. Stay tuned. As the United States officially entered the Great War in 1917, City College adopted a resolution. 
the College of the City of New York should take whatever steps may be necessary to cooperate with other colleges and universities in placing at the service of the national government the physical and intellectual resources of these institutions. Just as the nation mobilized in ways it never had before, colleges across the country did too. City College and Hunter included, the only CUNY schools in existence at the time. Indeed, City College's resolution proved far from just lip service. Students who left to fight were awarded full credit for their classes, and a student's Army Training Corps program, a predecessor to the ROTC we know today, was established, transforming parts of the campus with barracks and drills as an estimated 2,000 students trained in 1918, purportedly one of the largest programs in the country. The faculty was heavily involved as well, and not just as soldiers or officers. City College's president, Sidney Mezes, was tapped by President Woodrow Wilson to lead a think tank preparing diplomatic materials for the end of the war, and was a member of the American Commission to Negotiate Peace at the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Of course, City College has historically had a reputation for left-wing student activism, and support for the war across the country was far from unanimous at its outset. As such, there were student demonstrations against the war on campus, but more prominent were the giant pro-Allied rallies held at its former amphitheater, Lewison Stadium. Hunter College would hold massive events of their own, with reports of over 16,000 women present at a Hunter rally. Being an all-women's school at the time, no soldiers came out of the student body, but in offering war-related classes like wireless communications training, plenty of support staff did. Equipment and fundraising did too. Answering the government's financial call, Hunter College raised hundreds of thousands of dollars buying war bonds. For context, adjusted for inflation, $1 in 1917 is worth over $23 in 2023. Both Hunter and City College would also raise money to sponsor ambulances at the front lines. Hunter College named one of theirs after a professor of English literature, Helen Gray Cohn and 1916 City College graduate Malcolm Schloss was himself the driver of a City College ambulance donation, winning the French Croix de Guerre medal for gallantry at that. Hunter College made further contributions to medical services as well, reportedly making a total of 48,747 surgical dressings to be used for wartime, and their faculty teaching first aid courses. And after the war, World War I still impacted CUNY in unexpected ways for years to come. For instance, the war's economic boom contributed to the need to found a business school, which became Baruch College. After the Allied victory, Staten Island's Richmond Turnpike was renamed Victory Boulevard, the future home of the College of Staten Island. And war hero Alvin York was the namesake behind Manhattan's York Avenue, which in turn inspired the namesake of the future York College. But certainly, Hunter and City College take center stage. And while World War I left a legacy at CUNY, these schools can claim their share of having left their legacy on the Great War as well. For Urban U, I'm Ari Goldberg. Inside a building in the East Village of New York, a small choir is rehearsing the music of rural Ukraine. I think a lot of people come here, it's their solace. We, we come here from all walks of life, all ages. Sometimes you just don't want to be there, but we know when we get there, everything's just going to melt, and you feel so much better after the rehearsal. You really do. This is Ukrainian Village Voices. The main instrument in this group is the human voice. That is not just vocal cords, but a collective voice that reaches back hundreds of years. Musical director Joanna Milushko, a Hunter College graduate, explains. We perform as well as learn uh, music pertaining to the vocal polyphonic traditions of Ukraine's villages. And all of this music is sustained through the oral tradition. So through generations, from mother to daughter, from generation to generation, this music is passed on orally. Village music from Ukraine hails from the 19th century or even earlier, but owing to the emotional power that emanates from these songs in 2023, 
it is not just Ukrainians or Ukrainian Americans who participate. Eastern European folk music really moves me, has historically moved me quite a bit. So like getting to, instead of just listening to it, spectating it for a long time, getting to become a practitioner of it in a more involved way, really kind of was a tremendous bounty in my life. James Kogan has sung for a few years with the choir. It's cool that the choir is born out of this orientation toward like authenticity, toward doing like field work and taking things from the source and stuff like that. And increasingly it's like, you know, over the years that I've been in it, you know, a lot of people come and give workshops, bringing people who are in, you know, just like heritage groups or just like on the ground, kind of singing that music back in Ukraine. The group performs all over the city, outdoors at Lincoln Center, at Bryant Park, the Harvard Club, and this year again at the Brooklyn Folk Festival. They're wonderful people and bring wonderful musicians to town. We actually adore that space and you're singing in, in the church, St. Anne's Church is just so resonant and powerful. You don't have to even sing that loudly, it just carries. Although the choir is based in New York, the Russian attack on Ukraine is something that bears heavily on some of the singers' minds. We had a moment a few days after the invasion started where an organization here in East Village called Razum for Ukraine, which means Together for Ukraine, organized a concert for Ukrainians just so we can feel what's going on and to come together and to just to mourn or just, it was just a confusing moment, right? We didn't know what was happening, right? Our country was under attack. A lot of people only hear about the war now in Ukraine and that's what they associate with Ukraine, which is fine. But it's our, also our role to say, hey, Ukraine is, has, has this amazing tradition as well. It's enjoyable, it's diverse. Um, and so they can connect with Ukraine on a different level. Obviously this last year, the most memorable event has been a very terrible one. And so it precipitated a lot of performance opportunities. I wish we could have had these opportunities without that tragic backdrop. All of us have been very grateful for having the opportunity to not only help in some way, but also platform songs from the villages. These are often voices that are neglected. In 2018, some of the singers traveled to rural areas of Ukraine. I remember the, one of the first villages we went to was out in the northeast of the country. You know, we're like traveling for hours in this, in this little bus and this little van, and we get out and like, the whole village is waiting for us. You know, the women are there dressed up with this like welcoming bread, they call it the Korovai, and the, their like media journalists are there. You know, it was just, we were just, we were just here to learn this music and to share. Going back to the land of birth these songs only strengthened the choir's love of the music and performance. And the Ukrainian village voices will continue creating cultural bridges, community, and connection. This is already referred to as a tradition that is sort of dying out. I feel like the last 10, 20 years, a lot of scholars have been catalyzed to preserve the singing traditions of Ukraine. And the last year has, you know, made that mission even more urgent. For Urban U, I'm Craig Thompson. I am a creative technologist and a musician. I work a lot with code. Um, mostly I've been using code to generate music and visuals lately. I think of live coding as when people use code or algorithms to change an ongoing artistic process, usually for a performance. So that's like me using code to change a running loop or synthesizer. So something is playing and then I use the code to manipulate that running system. In Sonic 5, something you can do is write commands to tell the synthesizer what to do. So I will say, play this sample, play it this fast, play it at this volume. Mostly when I'm live coding, I tend to sample a lot. So I'm usually working with a microphone and I'm either singing or maybe someone else is giving me an input. And from there, I'll record that and use it as material. I also tend to layer other sounds in the mix, so synthesizers and drums. But with live coding, um, since I'm navigating a system, it's more about finding my way through something versus necessarily reciting or presenting a really set piece. And that gives that room for improvisation and unexpected accidents. 
There are a lot of programmers who come to our shows, but something that's been great is the live coding community is pretty involved with other artistic communities. So you can go to Wonderville, which is a indie game bar in Brooklyn, and we have a lot of algorithms there, right? So that's a place where more than just programmers are going, you might have game developers or just, it's a local bar. So we have just everyday people who might not have heard live coding before stumble in. Something that I just that comes to mind is how strong the women and female people that I've met in the live coding community. There's a lot of great leadership from, from women that I've experienced. Kate Sikio was one of the first founders of Live Code NYC. She was also my professor who helped introduce me to live coding. And she's been a really great mentor for me and other people. I recently taught a live coding course at Hunter. It was in the IMA program for the grad students, and it was an intensive two-day course where we went over a lot of live coding technologies, and at the end, people performed for each other. In that course, we go over a brief history overview of live coding history. It's mostly a hands-on class, though, where we just go through different techniques. Something that I hope that the students take away from this course is better understanding of how their computer works. How does the computer think? How does the computer interpret my instructions? And that's what I want the students to come away with is a deeper familiarity with, with that type of relationship. I also hope they come away with more historical context or just thinking about more deeply about the relationship they have with their tools. There's something about the connection between me and the computer that I also enjoy. Um, maybe I'm hiding, I'm not quite sure, but there is something different um, sitting behind a computer and playing versus maybe standing and performing like more classically trained um, from my previous background. Something I think about is normalizing live coding. I wonder what's gonna be like when live coding isn't specialized and what the conversations are gonna be like. So it's less about the novelty and more um, maybe about artistic techniques or where things are going. One of my dreams for live coding is it for it to be so common that you can go on a street corner instead of a guitarist, you'll see someone on their laptop. Um, that's my dream. <laughs>
Thank you for watching these stories from the largest university in the nation, the City University of New York.